can sell a painting to someone who gets it in their house and it's a very limited audience. So there's this thing about commerce and audience, right? So it's in a way, I think a little bit about making money and the way in which it's actually um, not very communal in a lot of ways because uh, there's this like a little inward guilt about making art as a cultural producer, which has this broader implication, but then in a sense, a lot of times your work is a minimal audience and uh, it's, it can be kind of problematic. So I think it's like something that I was thinking about in the conversation and wanted to have more people talk about it because I thought um, given the context of um, all these really interesting ideas about how we can have a more shareable economy, it's like art is this kind of problematic thing and I think that's what's interesting about it. And um, interesting to see what people have to say. <laughs> Interested to see what people have to say about about you know art and commerce really. Is it the medium itself that's a limiting factor, or is it art? Uh, I mean, I think it fits into an economic model. I mean, when you think about it, it's like you make a product, and the product is sold to a certain person or a group or something like that, and then it's either you know seen by a public institution or a private institution. Is it the market essentially? Yeah, the market. Yeah, I guess I guess it's like the art market is a, is a commercial market, so it's. It's it's a, it's a it's like a, similar to a well, it's not a corporate market, but it's it's a commercial it's a commodity. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah, we're, still, we're still part of the same. Because I was thinking, like, what's going on here? I mean, couldn't be much further away from what's happening in New York right now, mm -hmm. in, in the art fair, in a way. You know, yeah. where, and the people that are walking around there and buying it and where it's going right. in their houses. And, you know, so there is this polarity between certain certain element of impetus towards the making of art, but then actually where it ends up. Right. And so it's a strange sort of thing. Yeah, and I mean, and you're sort of, as an artist, you're in the part of the producer is you're kind of tied to that model because you're not going to make, I mean, there's a sense where you're making something for to make it, right? You're interested in making something, but you also have to survive and, you know, eat and all these things. So you have to make money off of your living. You have to make a living, you know. So artist like, or producer? Uh, both. I'd say both. Uh, okay. I have no expectation of making money off of what I do. I, I wish I did. <laughs> you wish you had expectations? <laughs> I wish I, I wish I, I wish there was a situation in which I could have an expectation of making money at this. <laughs> why, do, why do you make work? Um, because I like it too. I don't know. Uh, there's there's absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, that's what you think about. Share, that's the thing about art. It's, um, it's not practical in the same way, which is what why it's, it's important in other ways. Right? You're talking about a sharing. Are you making art for yourself or to share? Uh, I, I'd say I'd say that the work I make is sort of an expression of a viewpoint I have that is more communal and uh, is sort of about changing people's expectations for. In, in my in my work, it's expectations of how we interact or, or like do something that's sort of supposedly helpful to a community. But the question is then, if the artist just comes and does that and then leaves, what? What's the point of that, and how can those kinds of um, formats actually become useful, as opposed to being like sort of token participation? Or well, I mean, part of it's defining like what what resources does that artist have? Are they good in terms of uh, social practice, and, right? right? Or, or are they uh, just a good, really good at making a painting? Right. So it's like those. I mean, those are two very. There's a, there's a spectrum in terms of. Um, what so it goes back to craft and ability in some way, but so it was like, but I guess I I understand what you're saying in terms of someone being site specific and coming in, but how do you sustain sustain that kind of uh, uh, creative problem solving that exists for that situation? I think part of it is maybe um, they always have what companies have brainstorming. For th I mean, we're doing like yeah. corporate kind of brainstorm on paper right now. Yeah. In, in essence, but. You know, artists aren't necessarily part of uh, um, part of the equation in terms of solve problem solving. Yeah, I mean, art's greatest asset is not solving problems, but creating problems by asking more and more questions. <laughs> um, going to help people by giving them answers and not helping them at all. I think um, you can help them the most by teaching them to ask good questions. Mm. But it's also it's how you can put two different things that don't seem like they could work together together as a new juxtaposition, and that's also uh, I'd say another. I mean, that's another resource of 
that's that's kind of more where I'm coming from, and I would I would say that as a as a solution, not yet another like another problem to be solved. Yeah. Whereas that's something that's that's gained you now, like now where we you know it's like I think the question would be answered if you like in that way. But I mean, the question I think also has a, a point in terms of uh, in which part of we're we're just talking about solving a problem or something. But you know, what you're saying is also as you're trying to establish what a problem actually is. You know, you know. So I think the questions do come into that. I'm interested in this idea of what skills the artist would, you know, introduce to offer into a community that would be available in a more, you know, in perpetuity if the, as the artist leaves and then, you know, are there certain teachable, relatable, you know, current and viable skills that can be given by the artist to a community? Right, well, I mean, yeah, because there's so many projects like this, and it seems like some of them are sort of skills-based, and others are not. Others are more about leaving some sort of social kind of process in place by which people can um, sort of become self-determined. The sort of current economic doctrine has sort of created this idea each of us is a person with walls around, around each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I get... Um, more wealth if I push these boundaries out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, I mean, if one thinks about self as one's relationships to each, every person that one encounters in the life, and if each of these relationships can be more enriching to both sides, then everybody can gain. Everybody can become more individual because each indi each combination. I mean, and. Uh, uh, um, that's something that relates to Buddhism, actually, to Hinduism. There's an idea of uh, Indra's net, of every thing or every person being like a, a um, pearl in a net, and at at each uh, sort of node in the nets, and each of these pearls reflects all of the other pearls, but from its own particular vantage point. So each one is unique because it has a particular vantage point, but it, each one also is a kind of a microcosm of everything else. And if we can start seeing ourselves in that way, then there's not this need to try to do If we're like, hypothesizing an economy where compassion and humanities aren't the guiding principles, then like, to, to create that hypothesis, can we identify as a group what the guiding principles are of our current economy that are, are you know, the opposites of compassion and humanism? Or against, or and then also um, talking about like risk-taking by lending and what if people break my things or what if they don't come back? If we're guided by compassion and humanitarianism, then how do we react um, in this economy, this hypothetical economy, to um, when someone doesn't bring your lawnmower back or breaks your lawnmower or doesn't return your book? Like, what types of reactions occur? Maybe what penal system is there if um, these are the principles that we not only lend with, but also react with? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. Uh, you just made me think of this. In, in Paris, there's this fair jumpers union for like people who want to jump the turnstile and not pay to use the subway. And there are these informal groups of like 30 people or 50 people that meet up once a month. They all pay $2 and they all agree that they're buying insurance from each other so that if any of them gets stopped by the police for jumping over the turnstile, then they all pay the ticket, which is 50 euros. Um, Anyway, so like that's one <laughs> like funny way of kind of taking control of the of the economy. But I like I think greed and individualism are the two, are like the key cornerstone. And, and it's not just like that's a that's a joke. That's conspiracy theory. That's like explicitly a lot of our people believe that. Like, and greed, greed is valorized. So, yeah, individual. That's right. So the standard of living is very high. Uh, well, see, like in the Bay Area, place, are we willing to go down on it? Uh, should we go down on it? Well, didn't they, didn't the late the unions in Wisconsin agree to certain they agreed concessions? To pay cuts. Right, yeah. they agreed I, to salary. Yeah. Cuts. They agreed to all of the concessions yeah. they made, but the, the problem but was they the lost bargain. their co co collective bargaining agreement. Right. right. So they agreed to things that were about benefits and pay, well, pay is, I guess, pay is a benefit. <laughs> they put the pay salary in the benefit package. Um, 
right, because it's not the first time that the labor movement in America was defeated, right? We have a history of affection. <laughs> but it's not a done deal yet, right? We're talking no. like it's... No, no, no. Right. So this is... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Excuse me for not understanding the full context of the issue in Wisconsin, but is this just a temporary thing to to kind of balance the budget and after that it'll be okay? Or? No, no, it's like a permanent change. Yeah, yeah. this is a whole new yeah. tendency, it's a law, so political it's tendency built, of yeah. the uh, Republican Party. Yeah. There's a line of the Republican Party that says, okay, we want total control of the labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what, I mean, what about sort of, sort of looking at the question like the potential new yes. models for workers and labor? So you sort of addressed it by kind of worst case scenario. <laughs> what about best case scenario? Like, hmm. what about what's happening there and what is the vision for potential? Hmm. The, I mean, for, I would say the vision for potential is that the protest continues to such a degree and such a capacity that it actually keeps government stopped, yes. right? And a bill is defeated by the people and not by a, a vote on the floor, which is pretty radical. I mean, that'd be fairly radical. That sort of like, you know, that's like as close to Egypt as we're ever going to get. <laughs> so I, right? I was thinking of the way the social networks and how it creates this possibility, especially if there's a heightened awareness of interlocking different groups from different sectors. It's all about like cross sector stuff where, you know, typical. You know, a long time, you know, divided, you know, there, there's no power. And also the way that groups, you know, when we are divided, we socialize within our circles. We have no power. And also then we in, in, inevitably fall into a certain psychology, which is the psychology of acceptance, you know, and, and to, to take whatever is, is handed. But if that psychology is broken down by interweaving through a, a broader civic spectrum, then you have more social cohesion across the <laughs> ultimately can have more power than what's before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's an interesting piece of, you know, well how does how does like new technology, social networks and stuff interface with that? You know, to get all of us out of our I mean it works both ways boxes. though. It's tea party is definitely social network phenomenon as well. And the Tea Party has adopted so many yeah. techniques and, and very consciously so of, of civil disobedience and, mm -hmm. and one of their rallying cries is um, a lot of words of Martin Luther King and they, and they yeah. kind of flop exactly. that language. And right. the sort of theatrics. Which is brilliant. Yeah. I mean they've really yeah. they've really kind of embodied that that twenty first century version of that movement and in much more successfully than, than the left one. Right. It's interesting how politics is theater, you know? Yeah. I mean yeah. the, 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 this, the theater that makes things successful or, or unsuccessful, and the Tea Party thing was so scary, partly because they had such a good theatrical, like mm -hmm. you know, model to begin with, and uh, not to mention the money. It's it's off, in the morning, he goes to the plantation, he gets the food for the day, and brings it in, and it's like two hours, mm -hmm. and he can go out fishing for an hour or so. And then he comes back, and this is it. The time that's the spent the time for, is for, yeah. for so, so what are you doing here? Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, good question, man. I mean, like all of us, right? We we come from different countries of the world to be here, right? Mm -hmm. The food principle that brings us here for economic benefit, for education, and to just open our eyes to the rest of the world, right? And then then we can be in a position where we can compare and contrast between mm -hmm. that lifestyle and this lifestyle. I used to work for the Fiji Development Bank where we are financed by the Asian Development Bank of the World Bank. I worked for that bank for about seven years, where we go out and identify the projects that need to be developed, and then we fund it. So, you know, so coming from that background, I can sort of like see, you know, and compare and contrast. I say, okay, great, you know, there are values in this society, there are values in this society, there are values in this system, there are values in this system. But to bring it together, you know, and, and marry them, is something that's productive. But to me, as for, when I look at this question, yeah. To me, it's almost like at this critical point in human civilization, it's not a matter of choice anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of stipulation and mandate yeah. of resources. Uh, you know, it's not a question whether it's a choice anymore. We have to marshal our resources to the point where we can come to, you know, like more recycling, more, more sharing. Mm -hmm. Because the resource is going to collapse on us. You know, our economy is not sustainable the way it is. You know? Yeah. And, that's, and when that, that gentleman that brought up that early point that 95% of the uh, 
the five percent of the uh, people on this world owns about ninety percent of the resources. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the same old paradigm, you know, aristocracy, mm -hmm. the way it was developed in England, because they want to maintain the status quo and the wealth mm -hmm. and control and power. Mm -hmm. And that paradigm has to change. And it's changing because of people like us, because we are mandated. And when the when the economy collapses, the people that share that benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have pulled our resources. And, uh, and I was also partially raised as a Mormon, and I left the church about a while ago. And they have a, a program that's called a welfare program, mm -hmm. where they are told to keep six months of supply in case something, when the economy collapses. Mm -hmm. So they have the resources to save them within six months. So, no, ideas like that. I think what's, what's, no, go ahead, Beth. No, well, I think the um, food economy and what's happening in the local food movement in the Bay Area is really interesting example of how, you know, we can start to transform our local economies and mm -hmm. growing our own food. And basically, is you know, just becoming a radical art. Mm -hmm. But um, if we all, you know, I, I'm part of a community garden um, in San Francisco and have been able to grow kind of an amazing amount on, on such a little plot, and that probably takes, you know, maybe five to ten hours a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so just looking at that as an example. I think what's interesting about like this conversation, the one we had last time about food, is that just a common theme is like, and Chris, I think you brought it up last time, just like relearning as a as a society and as a modern culture, like techniques and and lifestyles and ways of living that that our ancestors and and right. people in so-called primitive societies are still experimenting with and still perfecting, and it's kind of like we're coming almost full circle in a way to really value and justify and learn from those mm -hmm. those methods, and it's it's almost. It's almost kind of, I, I picture people looking at this like from those groups and people from the past kind of laughing because they had it figured out and we're kind of just trying to muddle our way and, and cobble together a lifestyle that's sustainable within this system. That's she totally had broken. some incredible stats on the, the plummeting union membership mm. um, all across the country over the last, so, mm -hmm. and that the, actually that the unions represent the only significant amount of um, money spent on political campaigns that is still democratically controlled. Mm -hmm. So this is actually what, what her assessment and some other people are, is this, this is actually like this, it's a political manipulation that actually has this whole other goal to remove um, dem financial democratic um, because unions primarily support Democratic exactly, candidates. Exactly. And, and they're I think one of the only organizations that can contribute <coughs> campaign money because exactly. they, they represent so individuals, yeah. and not businesses or corporations. Yeah. So. Exactly. And that this, but but it's what's so interesting is this sort of totally reinvigorated the yeah. conversation about unions in, yeah. in America and their role and, you know, um, sort of what's a good way to move forward. I was thinking on the way over here when he when, uh, when he when he not, uh, asked this question. Like, what, what do socialist countries do? Because to me, one of the things that, that is problematic is that, you know, when you only have a couple very well, uh, sort of uh, powerful unions, then you have these disparities, like between like, you know, teachers get paid so much less than other unions because they were never as powerful. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe one of the things is like, we need just, we either need more unions or we need, you know, sort of a better structure of the union rules that you can't grab, in a sense, more of your fair share, which is what we were just talking about earlier, is like, what is enough? Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a, 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 challenging not only authority but like assumptions and assumptions mm -hmm. that we hold ourselves so like the authority that we exert over ourselves so not systematic social stuff but even our own we can extend to that but i think it's more important to turn that inward mm -hmm. and to be able to question your own motivations your own values so if the work you know encourages people to do that or is a catalyst for that i think it's successful that's great. That's an interesting feedback loop. You're sort of influencing the self, is what you're talking about. Making yeah. art to share, to influence self. Yeah, it's kind of like we're all making work for ourselves. Like, there's always your your biography is like embedded in your work, but if it doesn't have any seed for other people to mm -hmm. share some kind of their own uh, 
experience to it, then you might as well not even do it. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if we were to think more <laughs> collectively and not as the individual, then bettering yourself yeah. is bettering others. For sure. Because then you're recognizing that you're part of something bigger that's not just about you. So even, you know, like I'm hearing that and it's like, yeah, I make art for me as a healing, but, you know, as, as a form of healing, but I see that I can only, that is my only contribution to a larger healing is by healing myself. And that, you know, so I always have a hard time with the word power over because to me that's delusional. Like I don't have the power over anyone else. I have the, hopefully, sometimes the power <laughs> over myself to <laughs> then maybe inspire and you know put you know be the ripple in the pond with my pebble, you know. But that that's really the most I can hope for in that, and that's enough. And so, like I see, and I also feel like, <coughs> yeah, you know, there's nothing new. <coughs> Making new art is like. There's nothing new. I mean, we do things differently, but we're just, you know, everything's recycled, and that's okay. Why not? You know, like, we're, we're taking the collective experience of what we've already been through and taking that and going, this is what this makes. But is it really new? It's a comedy. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You know, and, and the way everything is just built with a certain way of thinking, you know, jo you know we value the way the brain works in certain ways and we really don't value the way it works in other ways. And there, is, there are systems that you can implement within education that would value a whole different structure of thinking and, and reward, you know, in terms of thinking about things creatively as opposed to these quite narrow ways that we're taught to think. There are actually all these statistics out, because I have young kids, and there's all these statistics out that talk about how, like, the, the future kids, the skills that they will need are, like, creative thinking, but I mean, like, the, the, um, the, social, like, social, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, like, the ability to be yeah. social ease. Yeah. And lots of languages because we're all gonna have to work abroad, yeah. you know. <laughs> but it, and it's sort of, of course, those are, English. right, right. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> our, our currency is <laughs> going down. Waiting. But you know, yeah, it's like it's funny because then those are the things that are sort of being wiped out of some of the schools. But then I've also heard people from the public school system here talking about how they're trying to actually restructure the education around those things, even in public schools, even though they don't have art teachers. So it's not it's not coming through. It's sort of making it. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point it's like more about your manipulation of media. And how manipulation of what? New media and how that sort of, your, your skills within that are, you know, both social and, um, what was the other one you said? You said social. Social. And, uh, it's a good word for that. Social. It's like social self realization. Social ability, ability to Maybe one of the fundamental divides would be between what we want and what we need. And then um, where we want profit, we want more um, looking more at what do people need to survive. Um, focusing on providing for people from the bottom up, people who are at the lower levels and providing for people who have less first, rather than looking at providing for people who can pay. Well, if we live in a society where uh, compassion and humanitarian, humanitarianism um, were our core values, and want and need would probably be the same, I would think. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's the hardest thing to like, teach for bits of students to get involved in the art, because they give all their time to art. Do you think there are any big um, corporations right now that are functioning based on compassion and humanitarianism? Like the for-profit corporation is legally responsible to not operate based on compassion or humanitarianism because they have, well, like a publicly held corporation has a liability to its stockholders to just make as much money as possible. And that, and if they're doing something else, they're like actually going away from their responsibility. As yeah, and they're, they're created to be, they're created so that human beings do not have to be personally responsible for their business decisions. <coughs> it's basically, I mean, that's why you have a corporation. So 
the shell. Yeah, the limited liability. So I think, yeah, I have a counter argument to that. Um, so I, I just attended an event with folks from the uh, B Corporation nonprofit. Yeah, that's interesting. And they're focusing a lot on um, kind of expanding <laughs> the idea of shareholder to include so so far, Vermont, Maryland, and New Jersey have passed uh, state law to allow uh, companies to register as B Corps, so that there are kind of set standards, or at least I think. Well, I think it's kind of up to the company to kind of set the standards as far as what kinds of health benefits people will get and other worker-related um, allowable criteria. But I guess the concept of corporation is kind of. Not being eroded away entirely, but at least now there are some other options that are gaining acceptance in the U.S. that are kind of focusing on on the use on on workers and their you know anything that can't be done by machines. I think all that could come into you know the broader uh, category of art because what is art? I mean, if if a computer could do it, I I would stop calling it art tomorrow. Right? I, I would want some human input in it, and that is what makes us unique. That's what makes an artist or uh, an art piece unique. And uh, what happens right now is like, okay, till somebody is not known to everybody, he's just this poor guy, and you know, people are kind of sympathizing, and okay, yeah, we know he's an artist, always on the fringe. And then once they become rich, or you know, somebody picks up on what they're trying to convey and becomes more accessible to a larger uh, population suddenly everybody is clamoring to get a piece of that person. So, uh, you know, the bigger artists would have to kind of support the smaller artists because that's what they came from. Nobody is born, you know, a popular artist unless, like, you know, they're prodigies or... Uh, they're yeah, but even so, there is a culture that nurtures them. Or, I mean, do you think this is happening in a vacuum? So, I think that's true and important to remember. Works like that. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so that's what. So when they give give back, what they're basically doing is they're making art a currency because they're not they're not just saying I'll pay you money for making it. I'll, I'll form a system. I'll form a foundation. I'll form a trust. I will form a school to you know train more people. So that way, art has become a currency for artists to trade. But what about trading with the rest of the community, the larger non-artists? What the hell is left? Yeah. Nothing. Like, and an artist gets nice, selfish credit. And he gets, he gets <laughs> probably bank. And like, he gets money. And, and you're a social he, artist. He contributed shit. And he got money. And that's what ended up happening. So then it's like... Good business model. Yeah, the, the cycle just repeats itself. And the tr the Trump art. Because there is a value placed on that, it's great that there's a value placed on that. But as artists, we're getting more and more competent in being able to like bullshit the language <laughs> to make it seem like our art is fitting into a specific category that does this, 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 and this. I love artist self descriptions. I think that's really wonderful when you go into a place and you see what one has written about their their work and how it fits. It's like it's different to read that and then see the art versus see the art and then read that. It really, it makes a big contextual. I mean, I think it becomes a problem if you have to read these descriptions by the artist in order to understand what's going on. Yeah? Uh, that uh, that if the artwork doesn't speak to you on its own, um, then the artist, the artist would be better as a as an author than as an artist if you have to read the artist statement before you understand anything about what's going on in the work of art. What, what motivates you? Um, well, I'm not technically an artist. Um, uh, or, or you just might, like, why are you I'm, here? Yes. Um, uh, uh, I am here because I know Neil Gorenflow and he brought me here. Um, uh, but uh, I'm, also here, I'm, I'm also here in the city because I'm going to give an. Um, a workshop about making abundance, making place for abundance. I'm um, uh, thinking of an economics of abundance that I'll write about. And part of that is seeing life as art. Um, and um, I do, uh, as, a, as opposed to a business, stack up your losses, you stack up your gains, and you sort of balance them out. You can never do that, actually. Um, but if you think of your life as being a question about 
just that idea of you know having this way of this global communication. I don't know if that's sustainable. Maybe it's a good thing to have like different words for love and different languages that right. mean slightly different things. And if everybody's using the same language, you lose the nuance of meaning that and can, the feeling can happen. And the, you know, Understanding. I don't know. Language is alive and culture is alive, and we don't really necessarily make these choices. You know, if something lives or dies, or how thing one thing develops. Yeah. I mean, that's what governments do. I, yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's also how people. You know, like how many times you write LOL to say. You know, it's like just saying that. Like language changed just there. You know. I mean, so it's not necessarily an awful thing. You know, some things. You know, uh, last a long time. So, like, no, I'm not saying it's like. Listen. I think it's related, like, to that what you said about the capitalist model and the way the capitalist model is set up to swallow, swallow it. Like one of the ways, you know, that I kind of I put it, because a friend of mine does a lot of work in in southern Mexico, uh, in Chiapas, and some of the literature reading there was the way in which to participate in the economy, you need to have value, and if your value is not recognized in that economy, mm -hmm. you're negated. Mm -hmm. as an individual, a community, or a group, or whatever, and you're essentially erased mm -hmm. from, from you're, you're, you're a non-species. It's kind of like when, you know, I, through that, mm -hmm. a, that friend of mine doing research like on the Zapatista movement, and just some poetic or interesting pieces about it, was this was like a whole movement where they mask themselves, they cover, they wear black, kind of like a ski mask, in order to be seen, both how was we to cover our faces in order to be seen because we're invisible. Mm -hmm. and, and our fear is actually falling into oblivion mm -hmm. because this, this massive tidal wave of capitalism and liberalism is mm -hmm. essentially just... Yeah. Right. How does this idea of the labor union transcend its history without not celebrating that history because it's amazing, yeah, yeah. obviously, mm -hmm. but also kind of transcend it to like appeal to people and to not be so stuck in the left, because I, I think that there's, you know, not to say I'm like a Republican, but there's there's um, a, there's a certain quality of um, the kind of libertarian side of, of mm -hmm. that that appeals to people in middle America and in, in, in America that is like, we don't want to be part of this collective system that, you know, if you're in a you know, carpenter's union or something is taking your pieces of your paycheck or yeah, whatever. Your people, individuality. You, your individuality taking away your pay. It's like another level of tax or something. Mm -hmm. And how, I don't know, how can that mm -hmm. be kind of engaged? Is there a sort of like quasi libertarian model mm -hmm. for the network, you know, labor force of a, or you know, an ego okay, that sells things on the mask and so on? Okay, let's get the recorder from the question, what would an economy look like if compassion and humanitarianism were guiding principles? And uh, who's that recorder? Fess up. Okay, come on in. Where's the other mic? I got it right here. You got it? Okay. So just kind of try to summarize, try to say some a few points. You don't need to like tell every damn thing that was said, but you know. <laughs> I was hoping to go last so I could assemble my. So report you could like think about it for a minute. <laughs> no way. So um, we our first group started by identifying some of the um, guiding principles of our current economy in order to contrast those with what compassion and humanitarianism would look like. Um, we identified greed and individualism, uh, the fact that value is created based on scarcity, based on privatization, and based on protection of assets, and that there's value on sustained growth. Um, also, greed, I said greed. Um, <laughs> we talked a little bit about um, how scale becomes an issue when compassion and humanitarianism are the guiding principles in that it kind of, just as our conversation today has been talking about how individuals deal with each other, um, we kept talking about situations that were person to person and on a, a very personal relationship type level and that there are other problems that you encounter when you try to expand um, those guiding principles to corporations or to nations more so than um, just individuals working in small groups. In just a moment. As far as how it would really look different from what our economy is like now, um, there was a discussion about an emphasis being placed on what we need versus on what we want, um, and that 
hoarding would diminish if we're guided by compassion and humanitarianism. Um, that corporations right now are created to, uh, one person contributed, that corporations now are created to alleviate individuals of responsibility for their actions. But when we are not owners but stewards of our natural resources and stewards of the things that we need, um, that responsibility is shared rather than alleviated. It's kind of taken on by everyone rather than masked by a corporation. Um, our kind of closing comment was that there may be a flaw to the question itself. <laughs> what? <laughs> that <laughs> we can't only ask um, what would this economy look like because the economy wouldn't arise unless those were the guiding principles of our society. So it's not really just an economic question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how can non-money economies, barter, trade, exchange, gift, et cetera, transform overall econ economies? Who's reporting? This is an interesting one. I mean, one person, sorry, um, somebody, I think, said something that resonated with a lot of people, which is that on a certain level, um, the, c the world's current system is not sustainable. And so that the idea that this economy will transition is inevitable. It has to because that this way of living and consuming and producing and sort of toiling the resources is going to make it inevitable. Um, there was a lot of concern over the dependence that we now have on this system, whether it's indebtedness, whether it's the fact that most people do work and maybe they survive barely, but that they do survive given the current economic system. And so there was a lot of um, people wanting to be thoughtful in a transition moment because however the transition occurs, there will be sort of losers in that game, workers basically. Um, there was an overall sensibility that we're in a sort of movement of a hybrid economy where you know capitalism, the money system we, that we all depend on exists and there's no way around it but that we can find large and small ways to engage in a more you know, barter system, barter economy. Um, and then there was initially a lot of discussion about just going back ancestrally, you know, three, four generations to the way people used to live and to readopting some of those um, ways of living. And then there were, the thing that was, I think, most fascinating were just some of the side discussions there in this last table there was a very long discussion about language a lot of the focus was on language and having the english language you know dominating really the global you know economy and the world and what that does to other cultures there was a lot of discussion in the last table about open source um and coding being sort of the um uh, the penultimate you know at least at the moment the best example of sharing and, and usurping the corporate dominance over something. Um, so it was in each table there, again, there seemed to be sort of one theme or one line of thinking that was pretty fascinating. That's great. That's a very quick summary. Great, that's terrific, thank you. Based on what we've been witnessing in Wisconsin, what is your vision for potential new models for workers and labor in government? Okay, this is a hard one. <laughs> But I have to say what was really interesting is sitting there all three times and somehow the conversation uh, um, was sort of linear. It went from how do we get there, what's going on, and then more visionary. I don't know why, but that was interesting. Um, so the, the question could have been read two ways. One would be that actually the protests and the power of the people would actually um, cease the bill from passing. I mean, that was my read of it. Like, I went to this optimistic, um, what's going to be the new vision of government and labor because the people will succeed. But um, not many people followed me down that path of thought. So we ended up going the other direction, which was the, you know, is this an opportunity to sort of look at labor and government and what would be the ideal situation? So it was a really interesting conversation just about unions and the history of unions in general. And... Um, uh, some things that were said, a lot of conversation about sort of the empathic response and the protesters and that many of the protesters aren't actually the workers who are threatened and how can that be harnessed um, nationally to create a sort of more um, 
a, a better understanding of the p possibility and potential of, of a kind of union worker protection system, which led to a conversation about this idea of a new social contract, which is what it would take to do that, um, where perhaps um, um, something like unions could exist for all workers, which most people are a worker, um, because that there is a kind of envy and a jealousy, um, despite people's capacity to show up and support those who have union protection, that maybe everybody deserves that. So um, sort of thinking about how um, the, the labor force as a whole could be looked at so that the private sector as well as sort of a state and federal worker sector could be um, a, a unified labor force. And so things were brought up like how in Europe there are country laws about retirement, family leave, maternity, sick leave, vacation time, and that those things are uniformed in non-socialist countries um, so that every worker has the same benefit. So if you... Um, are the person who cleans somebody's house and you have a baby, you have the same family leave as the woman whose baby you're caring for. Um, things like that. So that, that was kind of an interesting kind of direction that it went in. Um, the conversation was about how American values stump this process because of individuation and um, how personal identity is attached to career and ideas of success and money. And part of the conversation was about a, hy a hybrid, how do we keep what we can work with and what has worked and protect the most vulnerable and at the same time work towards a system that is community-based and not doesn't put benefit value on skills, um, but participation and uh, purpose even, that we all have purpose. Um, I'm skipping over so much because it was a really rich conversation. Um, trying to see if, uh, oh, and then something about what, what that regulating body would be, this sort of new public union um, that oversees the representation of workers as a whole. Um, and nobody could really address what that was, <laughs> as you can imagine. And there's a bunch of other stuff, but that's the, that's the snapshot. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. What motivates you to work or contribute your skills to the public good? How does money motivate you? We had three great groups that came by the table to talk about this topic, made up of visual artists, filmmakers. We had a couple of musicians in the group. We had a seed librarian, a sewing artist, and a teacher that was involved as well, and, and others. The discussion focused a lot around motivations and money for the topic, and, and three buckets came out of the discussion that were continually referenced. There was self-expression, making art for self, making art to share for others, and then the commercial aspects of making art to sell. The consistent rub was in making money. That was certainly a topic that came up time and again about how to actually transform creativity into business model or outcome in terms of, of capital. That extrinsic motivator uh, being a topic that came up and also the discussion also then moved back to what are the rewards beyond money that come out of being creative and making art. And those were basically informing people and persuading people in one way or another, informing folks in terms of educating them and enlightening them on ideas. And a common theme was subverting the dominant system in order to point at it, to make fun of it, to, to, to help people to see it for what it is and perhaps uh, change it, which moved back into changing community. And even one individual said, I'm making art to change people at an individual psychological level, which I thought was really, really very, very insightful. The, the concept of the public good was also something that we talked about several times in the group. And life, life, life as art was a, co a topic that came out of that discussion. And, and backing into that, you know, is there a public good and a public bad was something that someone talked about. And we walked away from the end of that discussion looking at a more unified view rather than public good or bad. You know, is there such a thing as good or bad? And, and can we look at art as more of a... a uh, unified view of an is. T 
two, two comments that really stand out to wrap this up. One individual said, I use my skills to create opportunities to interact with others. So that being, I think, a really good touchstone to the whole discussion. Creating opportunities to interact with others was something that people put a lot of value on, a word that we've used a lot today, the value. Rather than the monetary side of things, the value of the interaction came through you know, gleamingly in the discussion. And, and finally, somebody said, when we do get paid, it makes us feel that our work is valued. Okay. And finally, thank you very much. How can art be central to economies of the future? What would an art currency look like? Thanks. Um, okay, so yeah, we had three also really fantastic conversations, and I don't know if I can represent them completely, but we'll try. Um, they all... We, all, we needed to really kind of unpick the words currency and value and sort of even getting down to like what is art to, to try to answer the question. So that was something that was pretty consistent. Um, the first conversation started off with uh, talking about why this conversation is sort of relevant right now and, and the sense that creativity is something that's really needed in times of crisis. Um, and so as artists, all of the conversations had to do with sort of art in the broader world, like the, the things that we do sort of all the time are also things that are really important in the broader working world for a lot of reasons right now. Um, this conversation had a lot to do with the idea of use value and so we were going back and forth about whether art has this sort of function and can be goal oriented or whether it's about um, exactly the opposite of sort of a, a model w that's not goal oriented. And so this idea of whether it can be sort of applied to a, a situation that um, has to do with use value or have to do with some specific goal or whether the sort of very value of it is in um, dealing with the notion of the unknown. Um, we asked the question of whether what we were talking about had anything any different, was any different than the idea of the barter system and then talked again about the fact that art is not necessarily a solution-based economy. Um, we talked a lot about this notion of artists going into a, a community in order to try to do something um, with or for that community and how widespread that sort of approach is right now and um, what are the sort of good things about that and what are the problems with that, with sort of the um, sort of showing up quickly and then leaving and how much kind of, of a sustaining thing. How can artists do a project with a community that's sustaining as opposed to sort of token? Um, what skills does an artist leave in perpetuity or are they skills or are they sort of more um, system-based things? Um, let's see, so that was the first conversation. I'm sure there was a lot more of that, but <laughs> yeah, this was a, it was a pretty intense question. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, so the second group focused on the idea of art currency and what is an art currency to begin with. And so we talked a lot about um, this notion that the art currency currently is about both money and cultural capital. That cultural capital plays this really important part in the currency of art right now. Somebody mentioned this, um, this reputation vouchers paragraph that was part of our reading that had to do with somebody um, giving out time vouchers for services. Um, as, as a sort of model. Um, we talked about whether the art currency of the future would be exactly the same as it is now, where um, part of it has to do with reputa reputation as well as money, um, and that maybe we could have like some sort of art bank because existing official currencies are created by banks that lend value then to something. And so could artists create a value or um, an artist bank that involves some sort of network um, approach um, what's the non-pragmatic purpose of art? So um, this idea of process again. <clears throat> and then we ended up with the idea of micro-communities. So how can artists be involved in organizing people and using their reputation in order to help organize? And then sort of this idea that's really important, which is that the sort of notion of the individual artist has kind of disappeared in the sense that um, we don't assume that artists like work by themselves, but that there's this whole system of people around them at, in, in order for anything to become public, which were, are sort of equally part of what art is. Um, question number, no, group number three. So we've, we started with the question of, aren't, is an artist central already? 
as a currency? Where does art begin and end? Um, we talked a lot about p how a lot of people get an arts education and then go into all of these other fields. So there are all these people out there sort of working in the world who actually have this kind of education and creative approach. Um, we talked about the idea that artists are devalued if they don't make a living and how that could shift. Would it be possible to shift that sort of perception of artists who aren't making a living of their art as being somehow lesser artists? Um, let's see. Uh, this idea that somehow like artists who are poor are sympathized with and suddenly when they're success people sort of want a piece of them. And so we talked about these systems where sort of rich artists give back to poor artists, different kinds of foundations, um, different kinds of um, sort of ways in which money gets gives is given back to program to uh, to different communities. Um, we talked about the significance of the fact that participatory art has become such a big part of uh, the world now. We talked about art being alienating to a lot of people. Um, and we talked, the, the fundamental thing was how can we expand on the value system by which art is understood by the general public? Because there's this thing where um, children now, apparently the skills that they need to succeed in the future are um, creative thinking, social adaptability, and lots of languages because we won't be, we're gonna have to all be export workers pretty soon. Um, and so the, there's this sort of really big conflict between the fact that arts have been taken out of the school, but yet all the values of it are the things that are, people are saying are what we need in the future. That's great, thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I wanna go back to Neil and Marina and see if you guys have a, sort of one final comment you'd like to make. Are your mics still on or did you give them up? Um, I, I just, it was great to participate in all the discussions. I don't think it's a world of solutions. There are, I don't think anybody has a solution. I think this is an age of experimentation. And I think the, this, what we try to convey, both Neil and I, I think a lot of people are doing some really interesting experiments. And to the degree that you guys can kind of participate in that experimentation, uh, I don't think anybody has a model that will tell you that's what the future is going to be like. Um, y there are lots of different scenarios, but ultimately a lot of people at the micro level with sort of micro contributions are sort of inventing a new future and it's pretty exciting. So I just wanna thank Ken and Betty Sue and the crew that, uh, and all of you for coming and having this conversation. I, um, one of the things, once someone asked about well, what's enough, and you know, for me, for me, the um, one of the ways that I evaluate the quality of my life is the quality of the conversations that I have. That this is a really important thing for me personally to have this kind of these great, interesting conversations with different people. So, so you have made my world rich, and has this has been a gift to me, and so I thank you for that. Um, and, you know, Marina mentioned that people are doing all kinds of experiments and we're uh, at Shareable Magazine, we write about these exper experiments um, and projects. Some actually are not experiments, they're actually working. Um, and, uh, and so I invite you to come and check, check it out, shareable.net. Um, or if you just do a Google search on Shareable Magazine, we have a library of something, it's growing, but we have like 80 um, uh, posts on, how to, on different ways to share. Uh, and um, that's getting a lot of traction. So um, they, those might be tools that you can use in your life and your creative work uh, to sustain you. So that's, uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you both. And I, I wanna thank, yeah, a round of applause, please. I really want to second what Neil said about value, um, uh, for, especially on behalf of all of us who work here at YBCA, which is a, a really, um, I would say fabulous place to work, but it also has its frustrating moments. So you really look for those moments where you go like, right, that's why I do this work. And, and today and our last conversation was, was have definitely been those for me personally. And that's, that's really uh, gratifying. It's like, okay, then I can go deal with the budget on Monday. <laughs> um, I wanna call out and acknowledge Betty Sue Hertz, who's our director of visual arts, who curated this program. A 
Assisting her is my trusty assistant, Ren Ko. She's the one who made sure everything got put together. Jose Maria Francos, who is our uh, technical director, I made sure all of this stuff worked, as well as Guy and the crew and uh, Ewan, our videographer. Um, I want to really shout out a very um, heartfelt thank you to all of the artists who have been... Uh, it's really, this is really, I'm really loving having this time with you. I really appreciate the a slight awkwardness of being on display in a circle like this. And I, and I know for some of you that's even more difficult than others. So I really thank you for like swallowing hard and going, going forth and doing it. It really makes a difference and you have enriched our conversations so much. It's, it's quite extraordinary and I really look forward to the others. I want to thank everyone in the audience who came out today. Um, uh, we've had a lot of conversation about economies and measures and all that sort of thing. And as an arts organization, we're steeped in measurement, which is usually <laughs> about numbers and how many. But I think today proved that the quality of experience is, is at least as important as the numbers of people that are here. And when we're able to do both, that's really fantastic. Um, April 2nd is our next conversation on community activism. April 23rd, Radical Identities. May 7th, environmentalism, and June 11th on technology. And July 9th is when the exhibition and the whole artistic part of all of this um, begins. In the meantime, between now and then, the galleries are open. We have some really fabulous exhibitions. They're open until eight tonight. If you wanna hang around and go visit those, I would strongly encourage that. And I wanna note that next Thursday, um, we open the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, which runs for about a month with a whole series of human rights films that are really extraordinary. And also next Thursday, we have uh, a San Francisco artist, uh, Jose Navarrete and Violeta Luna, are opening their new piece. And I think this is a world premiere, if I'm not mistaken. So we're all a little like thrilled and delighted and freaked by that. But it's going to be amazing, uh, and I really uh, encourage all of you to come out for that. Um, so with that, uh, if you want to hang out, we will open the doors and the, the bartender is out there and you can hang out and talk. Uh, but thanks everyone so much for coming today. <laughs>